Bernice, and welcome to my podcast. I'm so glad you decided to join me today. On today's podcast, we're going to have an honest conversation with Sarah Neal about eating disorders, body image, and more in the skating world. Sarah is an ice skating coach in Louisville, Kentucky, a yoga coach, and an author. She also loves the Spanish language and Spain. So sit back, grab a mug of your favorite beverage, and welcome to this episode of On the Ice with Bernice. so excited because today we have with us Sarah Neal from Louisville, Kentucky, and Sarah's just got a wonderful story to tell, and I just can't wait to talk to her more about it. So Sarah, thank you so much for being on this podcast with me. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, first things first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, okay. Well, I am a figure skating coach, yoga instructor, and Spanish teacher. I grew up here in Louisville and, um, skated here, I guess, until I was about 12 or 13 and then started, uh, commuting to, um, a rink that was a couple hours away. And then went to college at Butler in Indianapolis, graduate school at Arizona State. And then after graduate school, um, I coached in Spain for a couple of years. Oh, wow. And then moved back to Louisville. I've been back in Louisville since 2003 and was our artistic director and learned to skate director for Louisville Skating Academy and just recently retired from those positions and so I'm just uh coaching now and teaching yoga and teaching some Spanish still. Now one of the things I just love about you is you haven't chosen skating and you haven't chosen Spanish you've chosen both of them and you're doing both of them and I just I just love that that you can you can do skating and you can do other things too. I think that's very healthy and very cool to see. Now um what was skating like when you were younger? Did you, you start when you were young? I did. Um, so I'm going to try out these readers here. I've got my contacts in and the, 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 the phone is like giving me a little bit of headache. So this is new to me. Um, I'm in that phase where the doctor says, um, I don't need specific bifocals yet. <laughs> oh, I but understand. I, so anyway, so we're going to try this out and see if I end up with a headache or not I don't, well, they I don't look know very lovely well thank you I'm <laughs> trying to get used to the vision here looking at the small screen um so uh yeah I so skating here in Louisville was was fun there was um when I was really little there was you know quite a big ISI program um mm. and that was very organized very at the time felt very large. I don't know what the numbers were, but it was very organized, very, and, and very fun. Uh, the rink was, was built in the sixties. It had an open end of no, the, the walls didn't connect to the floor. It was very seasonal. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and there were always threats of the rink closing, right? Because the, mm-hmm. the land was leased. And so there was always that kind of hanging over our head, you know? Um, and then, you know, at some point, because I love skating and it, when I was little, anyone that really wanted to be serious had to had to go away. Right. That was just the, the fact of it. Right. And so when I was about, I guess, 12 or 13, um, we kind of decided that that to get the instruction that we needed, we needed to start uh, commuting. And so we skated in um, Columbus, Indiana and Indianapolis. Then after that, which was Columbus is about an hour and a half and Indy's about, was about two hours. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so that was, that was where we ended up, ended up training. And that's what I did all throughout, um, all throughout high school, really. I think eighth grade, maybe half of eighth grade and then all of high school. So, um, and at that point, of course, then the, the instruction, you know, was, was much more technical, I guess you could say it was much more 
of what I'm familiar with now of being, you know, a, a U.S. figure skating club and being very organized um, in terms of the structure of um, the amount of programming and the, and the test structure and all of that, right? Um, and so some of the differences, I guess, between U.S. figure skating and ISI, ISI at the time was a, a bit more lax. I don't know what it's like now, but um, so, yeah, so we, we did, um, uh, we commuted and, uh, and then it became, became all about skating, you know, cause the, any extra time that I had was, was spent driving. So I didn't really have time to pursue anything else. I had played the cello before. And at that point then I had to, you know, let go of that. And it was just all about school and skating. And do you, do you wish you were able to do other things at that time or, or? you okay with the fact that you you devoted your life to skating in school at that time um I mean at the time I wouldn't have had it any other way you know and and I will say that skating has for all of the challenges I have had in certain ways skating has provided me a, a good life you know I've I've been coaching that's been my main employment since well since probably the year 2000 so for a very long time and, um, you know, I've met some really incredible people and had some amazing experiences and learned just so much about, about life, particularly just through coaching and the, and the skaters and the students, right? Um, do I wish that I had had time to take an art class, play an instrument? Absolutely. You know, at the time I didn't, didn't, didn't see the the value. I mean, I saw the value, but I knew I had to make a choice, right? There's time is limited, money is limited, and it just you can't do it all. Um, but, you know, as the years went by and there still was no time to do that in my life because the skating schedule, it's, it, I became a little resentful of the sport, I think. Um, because yeah, I think, you know, I'd love to be able to paint, <laughs> knit. So any, anything else, because there's so many things that are so interesting about life that to pigeonhole yourself is, is tough. You know, I don't, I don't think that's, you're giving yourself, it's just such a narrow vision. So when did you make the switch from a competitive skater to, um, would you say more of a recreational skater? Um, well, I mean, when I was, I guess, a junior in high school, the end of my junior year, my mom had a heart attack. And, you know, it was very clear at that point, the doctors made it very clear that stress level had to, um, had to go away, <laughs> basically. And so I, you know, I decided, I don't remember the conversations with my parents. I, you know, I felt like it was a pretty easy choice. They didn't even have to have a conversation with me. It was like, okay, well, I just, we can't keep driving as often. Like, that's just, that's pretty clear, you know? Um, and so at that point I decided to stop competing free skate and focus on finishing my dances. And um, we didn't have moves back then, right. I was still in the era of figures. So, um, so, yeah, so I made that choice and decided to start focusing on my dances um, to, to finish the last last few dances that I had. And um, so that was, I guess, right before my senior year in high school. And then when I was in college, I kind of chose Butler with the in intention of um, trying to continue to skate in high school. There, I mean, in college, there were no collegiate programs back mm -hmm. then. You know, we didn't, you didn't have the great programming that we have now with collegiate skating and the club atmosphere and the intercollegiate competitions like none of that existed I mean if I even wanted to teach a learn to skate class I had to submit monthly the classes that I taught to U.S. figure skating so I could maintain my eligibility in case one day I wanted to go back and compete oh, that's wow. how yeah that's how um defined the the um you know the the I guess the categories of coach versus skater and, and, and most people made the choice. You didn't keep skating when you were in college, there, there weren't opportunities, you know, anybody that was going to continue skating went to college part-time or didn't go at all or went later, you know? So, um, I did, you know, I was able to continue skating, I guess once or maybe about once a week 
throughout my freshman year in college um, and took a couple international dances. And then, um, but then by the time my sophomore year came, it was just, it was impossible. You know, I had lots of other work responsibilities. I was working a ton and I had um, someone in the family that was very ill and I was, it just was, it was impossible um, to continue. And so then at that point I stopped pretty much stopped skating. And then I spent my junior year abroad. And so I didn't skate then, you know, until I guess after my first year in grad school, one day I thought, you know what, I got to get out of this department. Like I'm living with these people. I'm working with these people. I'm studying with these people. Like I love my new friends in the Spanish department, but I need something else besides 24 seven with them. And so I happened to go to a rink in Phoenix um, and ran into a friend that I had known just through the Eastern Great Lakes circuit um oh, back cool. yeah yeah and um she was actually coaching there coaching learn to skate there and I saw her walking out and we talked and so I ended up starting skating there and I met um a woman that became a very good friend of mine who said we yeah you need to start coaching we need a dance coach when she start coaching dance and I was like okay so then that's how I started coaching oh that's awesome so so tell me more about this Spanish stuff so did you start Spanish in college? No, no. I started Spanish in second grade. Um, and oh, elementary wow. school, kind of the typical like one day a week thing or two days. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. A couple days a week. Um, I just know that I always liked it. Um, it was it was fun. I found it fascinating. I loved I've always loved music. And I think there's something so um so similar about language and music, you know, if you have a good ear and you hear intonation, then, then you're more likely to hear, to hear the sound of the words. I just thought it was always beautiful and fun to be able to, to speak a different language. I can't really put my, my finger on it, you know, but, um, and then when I got into middle school, um, then we had Spanish every day. And my, one of my closest friends, her, um, her mother's from Panama. And so she and I always did our projects together and, you know, just it kind of made it more personal, Well, she didn't speak in Spanish to us, but, but just made it real. You know, it wasn't like, oh, this is something that somebody else does or somebody else has this heritage. It was like, this is, um, this is real. This is personal, you know? Um, and then what else? And then in, in high school, I, um, I guess the next defining moment was um, I actually switched schools schools in the middle of my sophomore year and had to um they moved me up a level in Spanish because the other one wouldn't fit in my class in my schedule so then by junior year there wasn't a class for me and so I did independent study and the teacher allowed me to um tutor in the ESL room during that independent study time like I did my work on my own and then during like I was you know, like you would if you were a teacher's aide, I was in her room, but doing, doing my own work. And then she let me go and tutor in the ESL room. And so I did that and um, kind of helped some of the ESL students with just adjusting and English. And, and I met this one um, boy who was Colombian and we just really hit it off and started hanging out. And, and so that was kind of another defining, defining moment, you know? Um, and then when I went to college, I actually didn't, want to study like I didn't want to major in Spanish um I wanted to be a writer so I majored in English but um after the first semester I realized how much I missed Spanish and so then I signed signed up to do a double major and then um and then when I was planning to study abroad I actually thought about going to um, England for a semester and Spain for a semester because I had the two majors and I thought I've always wanted to do both. So that's what I'm going to do. But our study abroad advisor convinced me to go to Spain for a year. It was a lot cheaper. And he said, you know, you, by the time you get settled in, mm-hmm. it's time to go home. You do a semester. So, um, and that was really the, you know, the, I don't, I don't know what you call it. That, that was the, the main defining, defining moment. And ever since then, I'm just always, you know, kind of gravitated to that. It's just become a part of me. Oh, well, of course. Now, how did that lead you to go? Because I know you've coached in Spain, haven't you? Mm-hmm. Well, how yes. does that lead you to go coach in Spain? Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, when I was in graduate school, I needed a little bit of an outlet from, from just such an intense environment. 
And um, I was having a hard time finding a topic for my thesis, right? Um, you know, some master's programs have a, you do comprehensive exams, other ones do a thesis, some do both, ours did both. Um, and I just was having a hard time narrowing down a topic. You know, I kept researching, researching, researching. And my advisor was like, this is amazing, but I was no closer to coming up with a topic. Like, I, I mean, I was going to have to graduate, but I had to finish the research to graduate. Right. Um, so I just started playing around online um, and I stumbled upon, across this website. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. It was only around for a year or two. Um, that was about skating in Spain. And um, I connected with the person that had started it and um, started looking at, you know, at different rinks in Spain, just out of curiosity, you know, because when I was there studying abroad, nobody even knew about skating. Like I was in Southern Spain, I was in Seville for my year abroad and people there would say, oh, there might be a rink up in, in Haka, which is in the north, right? Um, it's in the Pyrenees. I, I think there might be one up there. I think I heard something about it. Or if there is one, we think it's probably there, you know, or maybe in Madrid or Barcelona, right? Oh, wow. So I ended up finding one in Haka and I went to skate one time when I studied abroad, but um, which was like a, it was like an overnight trip just to get there, you know? Um, cause it was so far away cause Seville is really far South in, on the peninsula. So, you know, I just out of curiosity started looking at these, at these, uh, different ranks and, and kind of trying to find out some more about skating in Spain and, um, then got the idea to do something with skating for my thesis. Right. So I decided to do, um, like a taxonomy of different types of commands, different types of what I call it the language of instruction, right? So for example, if you are teaching someone to do something, you can say, um, do this. You can say, I want you to do this. You can say, you might try this, all understanding that those are different ways of instructing someone or asking someone to do something, right? right. And so the idea was to just study what they are saying, and see how many times and in what context they use a direct command versus an indirect command and that, right? And so I decided, well, I'm just gonna go to Spain and observe skating classes and gather my data. And so that's what I did. Of course, there were problems there because, um, well, two of the rinks where I went were not, um, where they were not native speakers of Spanish. <laughs> so then the, the data was not valid, right? One of the places it was, I thought there would be more Spanish coaches there, but um, but the, the class that I ended up observing, the guy was British. And then another place, they actually taught the class in Catalan. So that was not helpful. <laughs> and yeah, then- my God. Right. And then the other place that I went, um, they were a little resistant to me being there. Um, and I didn't really know what was going on or why they were resistant until after I, I left. And then I, mm -hmm. and then I found out. So, um, and, and that's what we, I'm sure we'll probably, we'll get to that reasoning in a moment, but, um, so that's what I ended up doing. And, um, and my, yeah, I don't remember what, what I was talking about. So that's how I ended up kind of combining the two. Um, and since, since I kind of mentioned that, I'll just go ahead and tell you. So that place that I, where they were resistant to me being there, um, I had been in contact with the president of the club and that's how I made the contact to go gather data at that particular skating rink or in that particular club within that rink. And um, when I went to gather data, the president was very nice and very helpful. And then before I left, he said, well, um, why don't you come back and work for us? And that was come to find out why the coaches were very resistant to me being there because they felt, because there was a lot of tension in the group all along. And um, they, they, I think, felt that I was coming there to take their job, which I wasn't. I had no intention of doing that. Um, all right. It, That's it was a situation completely out of my control. And I was very young and naive. <laughs> well, so, yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Was and so, the, or go ahead, go ahead. Oh, so I was going to say, so in the end, I told them, well, I'm going to finish my data first. So I'm going to finish my thesis first, and then we'll discuss. 
And so I finished like the beginning of December. And then in January, we emailed a few times. And at that point, that club had completely split in two. And, um, and then one half of the club, the club that was backed by the money, um, then they, they hired me to come, come over there and, and try to run their program, which was a situation I, you know, wish I had known a lot more about before I went into it, but you know, hindsight's 2020. So, and I'm sure you learned a lot and then doing that as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You do learn a lot when you get thrown <laughs> in the deep end. Right. Right. And I, um, I think I've told you, I did contribute a chapter to a book that's called the forever athlete. Um, and that actually just, just came out in the last couple of days. And so I talk a lot about that process in my, in the chapter, I talk about, um, just some of the challenges and, and what it was like being there, because I ended up, you know, I was there for, you know, a year and a half and didn't really have a written contract. Mm. Um, had no visa and, um, oh yeah, it was kind of, you know, cause it was done very quickly and they just said, well, just come on over and, you know, and then we'll work it out when you get here. Cause it's much, fa- much faster and easier that way. And so I did, but then I didn't feel like anybody was, you know, really working on my behalf quickly. Cause in the end, I mean, knowing what I know now about clubs, like they were parent volunteers too. So, but at the same time, you know, they hired a 25 year old to move across the world to right. teach. They could have, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So, um, yeah. So, so I ended up there and I kind of, like I said, I talk about that a little bit in my, in my chapter for the book. So speaking about the book, um, would you be comfortable with sharing some of the challenges that you faced in the skating world? Um, yeah. So, gosh, where to even begin with that? There's a lot. And, and one of the reasons I, I do want to talk about this is because I, I think that there are a lot of people who struggle with a lot of the things that you've been through. Right. Um, well, first... I would say that, you know, when I was, I think there's this deep internal struggle within skating of, and this may just be the struggle within human nature, right? Um, But I think particularly it's an issue within individual sports as opposed to team sports. Um, And that is trying to find the balance between fun and achievement Mm. right um skating is such an expensive sport and it's such an individual model that parents become a little crazy about it when they're spending you know thousands and thousands of dollars you know about their children's achievement um and uh, and then not to mention that you you add in um the exorbitant cost of higher education And so parents are panicked about that. And, um, and then you throw in human nature, which is they're panicked about their kid, not measuring up to the rest of the people. Right. Um, And so I think that there's just an internal struggle within our sport about, like I said, about fun versus achievement. And so when I was young, it was all fun. You know, it was, it was just, it was fun. That's my only memories are of it being really fun as it should be when you're really young, you know? Um, but I feel like as a society and particularly skating in my era, we lost sight of the fact that it does need to be fun for beyond childhood. Right. Um, and when I wanted to start taking, I guess my, or start achieving more, learning more. I felt like I wasn't learning what I needed to learn from the coaches that we had who were super nice people, um, but had not stayed up to date technically. Right. Um, so then we just, um, it wasn't really fun anymore. You know, I mean, for me, the fun was in the process of achievement, right? Because that's that hyperness, that hyper competitive drive that, um, 
because the, the fun was when you're achieving, the fun mm-hmm. was racing towards the next goal. Right. But that's not really sustainable. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, and for someone in my shoes with the personality that I have, um, I'm constantly now I'm constantly trying to um, soften that competitiveness and soften that drive um, because I know it's not sustainable. It, it will manifest in lots of different ways. Um, now, mostly in terms of anxiety or physical symptoms of anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time, um, when I left, when I stopped training in Louisville or skating, because it wasn't training here, it was skating, <laughs> when I and started training elsewhere, I felt um, like I never truly belonged, right? I felt like um, I was an outsider. You know, I didn't have the... Um, the strong technical foundations in some ways that I wanted to have to compete with people that were, that were, um, that I was competing against, you know, there were no other outlets at the time. Like you couldn't do, um, theater on ice. You couldn't do synchro. You could, there were no other outlets besides trying to be a competitive figure skater. Right. Um, either you were someone that showed up for public session or you were a competitive figure skater. And, um, and so I never felt like I belonged, you know, I felt like wherever I went, I was an imposter. And some of that is because as humans, we have imposter syndrome, but, but it, it did feel like that because I, you know, I couldn't spend time outside of the rink with him to develop friendships. I couldn't mm-hmm. spend time with my friends at, with, with my colleagues at school or my peers at school to develop friendships with them. So it was constantly in between these two worlds, always feeling like an outsider. And feeling like even with my best effort, and it was never quite measuring up to this imaginary standard. Now, I don't know how much of that was the environment and how much of that was just me and no one around me had the knowledge at the time to intervene, mm-hmm. right? I mean, mental health has come a long way since the late 80s, early 90s, right? Oh, right. Um, and particularly mental health and sports and just the understandings of anxiety. Like we didn't even have a need for, we didn't even have a word for anxiety. It wasn't a mm-hmm. thing, you know? Um, but, you know, how did that manifest that, that hyper, com- that hyper competitiveness, the overdrive, the obsessiveness, you know, it manifested in eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it took one comment for my from my coach to my mom and then one time from my mom to me saying oh you might your tendonitis might be a little better if you lost a few pounds Mm -hmm. and that was that you know and I stopped eating for like four years I mean it just that's all it took you know um and I think that's really common among adolescent athletes who are struggling to gain some amount of control. I mean, adolescence is a time when people are just scrambling to find some semblance of meaning and control over their lives. And um, that manifests in, in different ways for different people. And for me, it was, for me, it was an eating disorder that, you know, I struggled with for, gosh, 15 years. No, oh, wow. Because uh, it's not just um, it, it can take many different forms, right? Mm-hmm. And, it, and it tends to morph as you move through different phases of life, right? Um, so, so that was one of the the main struggles um, when I came. Um, well, and then you know when I was coaching in Arizona, I would say I felt pretty pretty good. I was new to coaching, you know, so I had learning to do and stuff, but it was a pretty supportive environment. And it was coaches that had had, that had been very successful, but it was the lesser intense rink in the city. You know, it was an older rink, an older facility. And so it was a pretty, pretty great environment for kind of helping me find balance. Right. Mm -hmm. But I still had that drive of wanting to become better, you know, And then when I moved to Spain, it definitely was feeling like an imposter and feeling like an outsider. Mm. You know, I really struggled with that because um, the club had split, right? And so in this same ring, there were other coaches who blamed me 
Oh, wow. You know, and I had nothing to do with it. I just showed up at the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time. Who, you know, who knows? It depends on how you look at it. Um, but they, they, you know, blamed me and um, I was promised a series of things that, um, that didn't, that didn't happen. Um, or they happened for a couple of months and then there was just all kinds of weird circumstances, you know? Um, and so I definitely felt like an outsider, you know, I'm the kind of person I like to have information before I make decisions. And at the time there was no information available and I couldn't get information from anyone, like just even trying to find dates of a competition. Mm would say oh I don't know they'll send us something in a few weeks ahead of time that's frustrating yeah and there was no at the time there was no federation that the the local federation had gone bankrupt um there was no there was no there's no organization no federation nothing really and so they were trying to get that started right? Trying to get organized and stuff. But at the time, none of that existed. And there was no website you could go to, to find rules to find, I couldn't find rules anywhere. I couldn't like, I couldn't find anything. So that was very frustrating. And then, you know, later on, some people said to me, well, you didn't come in and take charge. And I'm thought, and I said to them, take charge of what, how, how was I going to impose rules when I had no access to rules? <laughs> mm. So, so there were some, some challenges there. Um, and some of that's cultural, you know, um, but the, I will say that the, the Federation has come, you know, tremendous um, way since, since that point, obviously, I mean, they've had, you know, uh, they have two amazing dance teams and they right. have, you know, Javi Fernandez and who actually was skating at that rink when I was coaching there. He was, oh goodness, yeah, he was with the, um, the, the, when the club split, he went with the other coaches. Right. And then I showed up and, you know, um, so anyway, it was, um, it was very eye opening, but I definitely felt like the outsider there, you know, it was very, very lonely, um, had a hard time finding friends because it's a typical skating schedule. It's hard to have a life outside of that. You know, you go in right. the morning, you go in the afternoon, you go on the weekends and you, you know, um, so that was, that was challenging. Um, and then when I moved back to Louisville, we um, went into overdrive building a program, you know, it was always, I want to prove that Louisville can have what other places have because like, we didn't have it when I was a kid. Right. Um, and so we did. We built a, hu a huge program, a successful program, had lots of skaters go to nationals. And and then we had some of the emotional struggles that come along with with that kind of competition. If you are in an individual atmosphere, you know, and um, yeah, so I, so I feel like. Um, that's a pretty universal struggle within skating, mm -hmm. and I. I do feel like it's a struggle within, um, within particularly individual sports. I mean, also in group sports, but particularly in individual sports. And, um, you know, and from what I have learned over the past six months and some of my yoga work, the uh, struggles with, you know, with body image and eating disorder, it's not just in aesthetic sports, right. not just in sports. It's, it's all over um, because because it is, you know, some of that's from society and social media. And some of that's just people trying to find ways to gain control of their life, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, for just the average person in a sport, how do we, what, what would you say to them if they want to help conquer this, this body image and this imposter syndrome and all of these not so great things that, that can mm -hmm. come in this awesome sport? Um, I would say just stay in your own lane, <laughs> follow your own path. You know, um, we can learn from others and we should learn from others, but we can't make it about the results at a competition. We can't make it about, um, how quickly you move through, um, move through the tests you know right. and that's challenging because some kids do respond well to that 
And I think coaches have relied on that mm-hmm. because a little bit of friendly competition among peers is not a bad thing when you're approaching it from a competitive, I mean, from a, from a positive, friendly uh, perspective, mm-hmm. right? But if you are challenging people to um, reach that next goal the fastest or... Um, or give up everything for the sport, then I, I just don't think it's sustainable, you know, not, not in a way that, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, that's not helping our elite athletes, you know, but I, I, if you want to become an Olympian. You obviously do have to give up. That's, that's a no brainer. Like if that's what you want, then, then, and that's what your family supports, then you do have to win to make that sacrifice. But in skating is a sport that that has to happen super young. Mm. Right. Definitely. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I, I'm having my own personal struggle there because I do feel like um, the Olympic movement allows, it provides inspiration and it provides, uh, it pushes the boundaries and it allows people to um, be better in some ways, but the way the sport has gone recently with so much, just so much push to having the younger athletes do more and more and more, it's, I think it's just, it's just too harmful. And I think that people have to focus on themselves, look at their lives as a whole and and make decisions about their skating based on what is sustainable emotionally, logistically, Mm -hmm. relationally, and physically. And, um, and if any of those get out of balance, then it's, it's not, it's not going to be sustainable long-term. Right. And And also realizing that you are a figure skater, whether you skate three days a week or all seven, that you still have to call yourself a figure skater. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's like, I had this conversation with my, with my husband the other day, we went bowling on Saturday night. Right. And I said, um, I don't know, for me, this, this is a correlation, but, you know, I, I am really bad at bowling. I mean, like most of the time, although Saturday I did okay, but most of the time don't hit any pins. Right. Mm-hmm. And I understand. Right. Right. I mean, it's cause I I've only been maybe five or six times in my life. Right. But I kept saying to him, or he, he likes to say, oh, I'm not good. I'm not good. But he always gets over a hundred, which means he's hit some pins. Right. And, um, and he almost like yelled at, he's like, I'm not good. And I said, can you just appreciate the context here? Like Mm. you, you are clearly ahead of the other people that you are playing against. I'm not saying you're good in a professional context, (laughs) right? But you are bowling, right. And you are you're bowling (laughs) and you are good compared to the people that you are playing with right now. Like we all know that we're not in a professional context. Would I say you're good compared to professional bowlers? No. Right. So I guess the correlation that I'm seeing between what you just said is that, you know, you can um, still participate in bowling, whether you are professional or not, and you can be a figure skater, whether you are an elite athlete or not. Right. Right. Um, and you know, I feel like there's some good things for the sport that have come out of, um, social media. And that is the fact that people are having fun with it Mm. and that is influencing the rest of the sport. You know, they can just watch, you know, like coach Michelle Hong on TikTok, and then go try something. Right. And I think that there are people in the sport that are trying to develop other outlets, Mm. but it is challenging to um, so we're as, as humans, we are all products of our own upbringing of our own traumas, whether they're micro traumas or large traumas. Right. And, and all of that, unpacking is like peeling back the layers of an onion 
right? It's so, it's so challenging to do that and to connect with your true self and, and, and teach or lead your athletes from that place instead of from the baggage with which we have been right and um and so i feel like so many coaches in our organization don't know how to relate to that mm. you know, even when they're trying to make a day fun or make a session fun so many of them um are approaching that with the idea of manipulating the kids into getting something done mm. as opposed to just pure fun. And I don't know if that comes from the fear of losing their job, the fear of, you know, losing their reputation, the fear of the parents getting angry that the kid hasn't produced results. Like, I don't, I don't really know where that's coming from. And, and I do know that part of that is my personality. Like I didn't learn how to have fun on the ice. I mean, I did when I was playing with my friends when I was nine, but it was not the only thing that was fun was the achievement after, after that, once I became you know a teenager. And so I don't know how we can as a sport until we start doing things more in a team atmosphere in terms of training, how we can, um, how we can bridge that gap and find that balance. Right. You know, community I, I, is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know how we, how we can do that. I, I feel like it's a structural issue. You know, there's so many, um, there's just so many, so many issues with having a sport where all the coaches are, are working as individuals. Mm. You know, and I, I don't, um, and that's why synchro has become so popular. And that's why theater on ice has become so popular because, um, because kids want to be part of a group, you know, and you Most have kids, built in friends all, and it's, it's, yeah. it's good. Yeah. I mean, not all kids that, and that, that's true. Some people are more solitary individuals, you know, and that's, I definitely was, you know, I was not a big group person or a team person, um, but maybe that's because I didn't have the right modeling. Maybe I didn't know. You know? Right. So I don't know. I mean, I think that all of that, there's so many of our coaches, at least my generation are in the generation, you know, older than I am, if they're still coaching is kind of caught in that, in that position. A few of us, you know, were taught to, um, or figured out how to move kids forward while, while having an atmosphere of just pure joy, you know? Mm. So how does yoga fit into all of this? So for me, um, yoga was key to helping me um, turn inward mm. and shut out the chatter in my brain and my cat is eating the phone now <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful cat what's your cat's name vincent oh hello vincent welcome to the podcast <laughs> so um it was it was um instrumental in in my healing from some very difficult moments because i was able to just turn inward and tune out the chatter and yeah reconnect with my breath and my self and and in my body right as a as a being as a as a living breathing being as opposed to something that does and achieves right and um and once you can do that and you take the time out to to explore that then you then it becomes about, you know, the exploration and the curiosity and um, the moment mm. and exist and experiencing rather than achieving. And the achievements will come because you, you automatically will get, well, you will get better and you will, but it's a much more joyful process than a fear driven process. And for me, that was, that was crucial. And it is crucial. Like if it, when I don't practice as much, I find myself falling back into old habits, back into old thoughts, you know, um, back into old 
challenges with eating, you mm. know, where I control, control things in my own way, instead of just riding the roller coaster with the breath, you know? Um, and I feel like for so many skaters, it could be helpful in that way, but a lot of people don't, they don't want to do yoga that way because sitting still is scary. No, um, I agree with that. <laughs> sitting still is scary and, um, and just being alone with your thoughts can be scary. Right. And, um, and there's still this misconception among many coaches that yoga is for flexibility, which mm. it can do flexibility, but that's not the intention of yoga, right? That's not the, the idea behind it. That's not the, the, you know, the centuries of wisdom behind it. Um, and there is, you know, an idea too, among certain coaches that the only kind of off ice that's valid is off ice that makes you sweat, mm. you know? I mean, yoga makes me sweat, but it doesn't make everyone sweat. Some people never sweat at all. So does that mean they're not exercising? You know, it's, you know, but yoga is more, it is an exercise for the body, of course, but I approach it more of an exercise for the mind mm. because it's you trying to just become aware of your body and how maybe it's different than it was yesterday and what you're feeling and how the breath is and how uncomfortable you are in these particular postures and how does that make you feel? And is the mind wandering right now? Like, what are you thinking about? Are you mm. looking at dust in the vents or are you looking at that ball of hair on your mat? Are you, <laughs> you know, all those things. Um, or are you worried about so-and-so across the room who you think her pose looks better than yours, right? And it's, it's, about, it's about all of that, you know, just... Um, the back and forth, the finding ways to be steady in the moment. And, and I think that we all need, we all need some of that. Yeah. Well, and I've never thought about it that way as it's almost like good mental training for skating as well. Mm -hmm. like, Absolutely. And, yeah. Cause I know when I do yoga, I'm just trying to survive because it's a lot harder than it looks. Mm hmm yeah. And I, you know, I don't teach a kind of yoga that's like, I don't teach power yoga. I don't teach a vinyasa style yoga. I mean, there was a period where I was practicing that, but, but I started to have hip issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some, you know, tendonitis going on in one hip. And then I started to have shoulder issues and, you know, and some people think, well, that stuff works itself out if you keep, if you keep practicing. Um, but we don't really know, <laughs> uh, you know, when you got to keep going and you got to keep walking and you have, you know, a family to take care of and students to take care of, you can't, can't be injured. Um, so I just started going a little bit more relaxed. Um, and particularly during the pandemic for me, the more vinyasa styles of yoga actually made me more anxious. Now, not everybody is that way. Like everybody mm. has, a different tendency in their body, a different tendency in their mind, right? Um, and some people prefer that because it maybe opens their breath up more. I don't know. But for me, um, a slower style yoga is much more effective. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good for me to know, especially because I got troubles with my hips as well. And I'll have to keep that in mind. Um, so I know you do, you do yoga classes online, right? So if anyone was looking for a yoga class, where would they go to find yours? So the yoga classes that I teach online are uh, through an online software platform um, that I run through called Hey Marvelous. But there is a link on my website to that. It's the, called the skatingyogi.com. And I have um, a membership. That it's a monthly membership that has, we have an on-demand library of checklists and information and um, meditations and journal prompts and practices of all different lengths. And then we do a weekly live class on Thursday evenings. It's usually 6.45 or 7 Eastern time. And the replay is, is available. So if you can't make mm -hmm. the live and that's on there. And so if you don't want to do the membership, um, you can do the a drop in, like I sell a class card and you can do a, you can attend the class live. Well, that sounds like a really good option. And on this website, you also have 
um, a link to the pre-order for this um, book that you're in, right? The Correct. Cyber Athlete. Correct. Got a chapter in there. I'm excited yeah. to, I'm going to go pre-order my copy because I, I want to hear more about what you have to say on all this because I do think it's a very important topic that we, as all as skaters, need to think about because yes. we're all in some way living through this. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, so much of our, a lot of our mindset is developed by skating, but a lot of it is, it's just the human condition in a different form, you know, just dressed up in a different color and a different outfit. You know, it's, Mm. it's just uh, so much of what we, so much of what we learn and how we are is conditioned from skating, but it's just its own. It's like skating's take on the human condition, right? So it's right. It's just because we're human. Like I was in a yoga class because I teach at a couple places around town too. And um, there was a man in my class, and they were they brought up skating, and um, and I mentioned my frustration with the sport. I said it's you know there's so much that's beautiful about the sport, but I'm so frustrated with um, with so much about the federation and and the current situation and he said well that's because humans are involved (laughs) amen to that i and i I think maybe just skating brings out certain things of human nature that other things don't right and i think certain certain personality types are drawn to individual sports Mm. right and that kind of exacerbates the situation right Mm. So it's something for us to, you know, to consider as we, as we stay involved in the sport and how can we cultivate those feelings of community and mutual support and, and joy, right? Just if we can keep the joy and our daily right and our presence on the ice and know that it is a gift that mm-hmm. our contributions to the sport are because we've been given a gift, the gift of skating, then that can can maybe take us a long way that's a great goal to have just to find the joy in the sport i love yeah. that um so one last question for you sure um who do you know that i should interview next that's a good question what are you um what are some other topics that you're interested in uh the, like what would wide you... open anything in the wide world open. of skating because everyone is welcome on the ice okay um, hmm. I don't know. Can I think about that and get back to you? Yes. <laughs> I like thinking. Okay. Do you have a preference of age group? Not at all. I mean, I'm really old, so that <laughs> I don't know if I could find someone older than me skating, but I, you might could. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Well, let me think about that. Um, let me think about that. I think there's lots of, lots of options. If you can, you know, if you want a, um, you know, a collegiate skater or a soon to be collegiate skater or a former collegiate skater or a show skater, or there's all kinds of, all kinds of options. I'm, I'm welcome to, I'm open to talk to everybody and anybody. Okie dokie. Well, I will, um, I'll think about that and I'll send you, send you some names. That sounds lovely. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for talking with me today about all these important things in the sport of skating. It was really a joy to just hear all your thoughts and hear your life story. And I'm just so glad to know you. Yes, it was so nice talking to you. Thank you so much. All right. See you later. Thank you for listening to this episode of On the Ice with Bernice. On today's episode, we learned more about Sarah Neal's skating journey and how it ended her up in Spain and had an honest conversation about body image, eating disorders, and more in the skating world. Would you do me a favor? Would you like and comment, maybe even subscribe to my podcast? And if you're feeling extra generous, would you share an episode of my podcast on Facebook or Instagram? This really helps podcasts like me get going. This episode was researched and produced by Anna Blankenship and hosted by me, Bernice. 
most importantly, remember, everyone is welcome on the ice.